to achieve the ambitious sustainable goals, the six targets, sustainable goals, clean, clean uh, drinking water, adequate sanitation services, good hygiene facilities, sustainable water resource management, etc., etc. So my question is, 2030 is tomorrow. And what has been achieved since, since 2015? What has been achieved since 2015? Are we in a positive or a negative direction? Can we reach the six targets of the Sustainable Development Goal 6 by 2030? If not, what are the main challenges of the Sustainable Development Goal 6? Thank you, this is my question. Si Mohamed, vous voulez répondre à question par question, qu'on les réunit comme, comme vous voulez. Allez-y. Thank you, Professor Vesri, for your comment. First, I'm sincerely humbled by your appreciation of my modest presentation. The uh, UN uh, Progress Report 2021 that uh, I mentioned was uh, based on a global survey. And uh, indeed, if you take uh, access to drinking water, water and sanitation in many places, we are uh, lagging behind. And even mobilizing water resources. So uh, an accelerated program has been uh, designed. And uh, the survey shows that uh, there are needs first in terms of financing and we have the experience of Morocco. You have seen that uh, almost 3% of GDP goes to water infrastructure, uh, which is uh, very important. There is uh, an issue of uh, institutions. That's why I insisted on institutions and the governance and uh, the regulatory framework. Again, if you see in Morocco, this has been addressed by, uh, we have a water law, we have a high uh, Supreme Council for climate and, uh, and water, which is uh, not only a deliberative body, but uh, also a body that gives orientations. And we have a program and uh, His Majesty in his last uh, speech, mentioned this uh, program. We are going to pursue the capture of our runoff. 20 dams, large dams, are under construction, which will add to the 149 dams that already existing, along with hundreds of small uh, of small. Uh, small dams. We have a very ambitious program of building uh, uh, desalinization plants. Nine plants are in the pipeline. pipeline. So uh, uh, this is really uh, important. And uh, among the other uh, points that uh, the uh, the report mentioned the science and technology. 
So uh, we are really now running against time. And time for action is now. Thank you. Alors, il y a deux questions. Je donne la parole à Monsieur le Chancelier, c'est Mustafa Bousmina, et après ça, ça va être à vous. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mohamed, for a very comprehensive talk. I really enjoyed. I have two short, very short questions. First one: Are we using in Morocco the brackish water? Les eaux sumates. Second, what are the projects in the pipe presently in Morocco for desalination? Bearing in mind that we are living in a region with a strong scarcity, water scarcity, but at the same time, we are surrounded by 3,500 kilometers of sea. Yeah. Concerning brackish water, it is uh, used, I should say, by, uh, by accidents and uh, by need, especially along the coastal line. But uh, it has uh, uh, major drawbacks, mainly with the salinization of uh, uh, the soils. Uh, the second uh, one, uh, people pump along the sea line, they really uh, accelerate the uh, salt intrusion in the aquifers, which is also very dangerous for us, and this is happening nearby at Walidia and in that area, which shows to be uh, a major area for produ pro the production of horticulture products like tomato. And uh, we have also, as you know, an important groundwater in the, uh, in the south, in the Tafilat. Uh, very important, when it was discovered first, it has raised a lot of hope, but it is brackish. And uh, the problem is that there is no enough rain uh, to clean uh, the soil. Saying this, you know that brackish water is very good for vegetables which tolerates salt. So uh, this is for your uh, first uh, question. Please uh, tell me uh, desalination. Desalination uh, used to be an option when uh, the uh, energy costs are high. Now it's not anymore an option. It's, uh, uh, it's a must. We don't have other alternatives. And thanks God, we have renewable energy. For example, we are building the uh, desalinization plant in Dakhla. It will be all renewable energy. And there is a huge progress today in Japan we have what they call the one million desalinization plant, which means a plant that produces one million cubic meter a day. So it was said this morning, we cannot complain about water scarcity since we have 70% of the, the globe all covered by water. But uh, we should be very cautious, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with desalinization. Alors, la dernière question, et on passe à l'autre. La, Très courte, s'il vous plaît. Oui. All right. Thank you. Sir, I would like to compliment you for a very nice talk. Water, indeed, is life.
That's, uh, that's the shortest one can say. But I would like to take you to the third pole, the third ice pole, which is the Karakoram Himalaya Tibet region. This has been named as the third pole by some Chinese environmentalists. The melting of ice from the third pole is playing a crucial role in agriculture activity of at least 1.5 billion people in China, Indochina, South, South Asia, and of course in some parts of uh, the Central Asia also. Now, if global warming <coughs> continues, and it probably is going to continue, that ice can melt and there will be a very serious situation of food security. Having said that, if global warming continues, and I repeat, it will continue, uh, oceans would spread, there will be more area covered by the oceans, and because of the raise in temperature, there will also be more evaporation. Now, what are the current models suggesting regarding the increase or decrease of future rains? If the water uh, coverage increases and the water evaporation because of temperature increases, would that automatically mean that there will be more rains in the world or not? Thank you. S'il vous plaît, est-ce qu'on peut avoir une réponse rapide? Parce qu'on a dépassé un peu le temps. Yes, uh, thank you for this uh, your question. Uh, I spent uh, time in uh, Nepal studying the water resources there. And uh, the melting of the glacier is a very, very serious uh, issue because uh, they don't have the capacity to control the flows. The whole Ganges basin depends on the glaciers uh, melt. So uh, this is really a very, very important issue for the countries like India, Pakistan, and uh, others, uh, especially relying on uh, irrigation and water control. And. Uh, uh, this is also a big concern. Uh, Switzerland is suffering 6% uh, melting of the, the glacier, and we know what happened with, uh, in, uh, in Italy also. So this is a big, big uh, issue. Uh, now, uh, uh, the climate uh, model shows that uh, Globally, the drier regions will become drier and the wetter regions will become wetter. So this is what uh, the, the science says uh, now. But the problem, as you know also, there is a, a new study from the US which called for the fact that increasing the flow of water to the atmosphere to evaporate transpiration will worsen climate change more than carbon dioxide. So Merci this is si a Mohamed. big problem. Merci, si Mohamed. Je repasse la parole à Si Hamza. <coughs> Danny. Sitna <coughs> Ian. استثنائيا زميلتي سمحت استلقاء بأكثر من سؤالين الوقت لا يرحم لكن مباشرة نمر للمداخلة الثانية كما سبقت أن قدمتها وهي للدكتور والزميل عدنان بدران حول موضوع التعليم العالي بعد جائحة كورونا المستجد 
لا بد من وقفة ولو سريعة لنقدم هذه القامة العلمية إنها قامة متميزة شاهدة على مسيرة أكاديمية العالم الإسلامي للعلوم منذ أكثر من ثلاث عقود حاصل على دكتورة دولة من جامعة ميشيغان سنة 63 مساهماته العلمية في ميدان التعليم العالي والبحث العلمي تشهد له بالقدح المعلى كرئيس لعدة جامعات ببلده الأردن وخارج بلده مثل جامعة ليرموك وجامعة فيلاديفيا بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وزير الفلاحة سنة 89 وزير أول سنة 2005 مسؤول متميز لدى منظمة اليونسكو وممثل لأكاديمية العالم الإسلامي للعلوم في لدى أبرز الأكاديميات العالمية الدولية له في الأخير وليس أخيرا حوالي أربعين مؤلفا وأكثر مئة وخمسين مشاركة فله الكلمة شكرا دكتور حمزة الثاني You were very generous. I hope you will be generous also in on the time for my lecture. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I'm giving you today is uh, something we prepared between University of Petra in Jordan and American University in Beirut. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is a joint work, a joint project. Myself uh, representing uh, the academia at uh, University of Petra and Dr. Baidun, Elias Baidun, who's here, Professor Baidun, representing the team uh, at the UB, the American University of Beirut, with Madame Mismar, Professor Mismar, or Dr. Mismar. What I am presenting you is really something uh, we pass by, and we should not forget it, what we have been in the pandemic, corona pandemic. It was two to three years almost. And I think has affected our life, our procedure, our style of life, our education system, the online, the electronic, everything has been affected. And we shouldn't just let it pass by. We should really examine what happened and how could we learn from it to improve our pedagogy system, our learning system, educational system, and also to improve our delivery, delivery of food security, of water scarcity, and others. Climate change is coming. Another ma disaster. I don't know whether I call it man-made disaster because of the CO2 emission, or shall I call it nature disaster, natural disaster. We don't know. Science believes very strongly that this is a man-made disaster because of the gas emission. Others don't. Others don't. Trump, the past president of the United States, doesn't believe in it. Why Al Gore, the vice president of the United States, very strong believer in it. As a matter of fact, he's a member of the IPCC, the International Panel, Panel on Climate Change. Joe Biden believed in it. He went back to Paris Agreement. He went back to Paris Agreement. The United States is leading now. We don't know. The US change from president to president. It doesn't have a continuous bylaws where the US will stick with it. People believe that if Trump changed, he will cancel the protocol agreement of Paris. By the way, this is disaster. 
not disaster for the U.S., for us, all of us. Because we, we live under one roof. The roof is climate change. It's affecting us all, whether in Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, or the Middle East. We will be affected. And simply, yani, you, need, you need decision by uh, one country affecting the others, I think it's a crime to me. And we shouldn't pass by easily. We publish a book here. This is number seven, by the way. Every year, a book comes out from the Arab Academy of Sciences. And this is representing the Arab Academy of Sciences. And this is a joint project between the Arab Academy of Sciences and the University of Petra. And this is number seven in Springer Nature. And the, the thing one, uh, every year we hold a, uh, a conference in Beirut around a theme under the higher education in Middle East. This is the broad line. Under it, we select a theme, quality, innovation, uh, graduate studies, research, R&D, et cetera. So many themes we've been selecting. And we come out with a book. This book came about the title of our lecture today here, which is the pandemic, the post-COVID-19 lessons from a pandemic. The summary, which I want to present to you, is really online e-learning has saved the educational sector from lacking disaster. Probably you don't believe in e-learning. Probably you are a strong believer in face-to-face -face learning. But to tell you the truth, if it wasn't for online learning, and if it wasn't for uh, packages prepared for online learning and the different courses, universities, higher education will be locked, was locked for three years. At least I know this in Jordan. I think the e-learning and the internet has saved us. The second thing, style of educational pedagogy will be changed. I don't think we will go back to our universities and we will continue business as usual, no. I think we have learned a lot from this pandemic. And this is why many universities right now, at least I know in Jordan, they shifted to blended learning. No more, no more dogmatic uh, talqeen, no more of that style or that style of learning. That one is over. Internet uh, will be used heavily. Learning packages by publishers will be used heavily. Turn on, on lectures from Stanford, MIT, Yale, uh, uh, and other universities in the world who offer almost the same courses we offer and free of charge, free of charge. But you cannot earn a degree. Free of charge to look at the courses and to learn from the courses. And this is where blended learning will become so beneficial for our higher education system. Where, 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 where the professor becomes facilitator rather than uh, disseminator. And to facilitate things. Uh, where he shifts to lectures from all over the world. Uh, strengthening his lecture in front of the students. And I think blended learning is coming very soon, very quickly. We have created in every university uh, a center, it's called Center of Academic Development, to really train teachers, the professors. It doesn't mean that the professor, he knows everything, you see. He is a good researcher, good in his subject, but pedagogy is lacking, using the technique, or the modern technique of learning. And this is why uh, we need those centers to be in the university, to have in-service training for the uh, teachers or the professors you know, to learn about how to use blended learning by using internet very effectively and efficiently. So blending architecture of resilient, interactive learning will be emerged and really is emerging very quickly. It's changing, 
changing the style, changing the theater, theater of learning. The classroom is becoming a smart classroom after this pandemic. And uh, companies right now, they earning a lot of money by making use of the, of the disaster we faced in the pandemic by selling classrooms, smart classroom, magic blackboard, smart board, and smart in everything. So the professor is becoming facilitator using all the techniques, the modern techniques after the pandemic. Uh, new, really new, uh, what I call new architectural landscape uh, is coming, is emerging uh, to stimulate the minds, to stimulate thinker, how to think, uh, to stimulate really the critical thinking and the future challenges we are going to face. Challenges cannot be solved by giving a lecture, but could be solved by a thinking how to solve problems. And problem solving, we will face uh, all challenges, including water scarcity, which we've heard just uh, today and right now. It's a, it's a big challenge, but scientists could solve it, I'm sure, like they solved the food security in the past. So the pandemic era, oh, I, I forgot to shift. Uh, you can see that uh, in 2019, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus hit uh, and, uh, and uh, really causes uh, uh, a, a pandemic across the world. Uh, it was well detected in China, as you know. I don't want to, uh, uh, in 2019. And uh, uh, I don't think it has spread from China, but it's there everywhere. Uh, we don't know until now the origin of it. And nobody knew all what, what we hear, hypothesis. Or oh, this was made, genome made uh, in some lab. Or oh, uh, this is engineering uh, uh, genetics, you know. You know, they played with the DNA and RNA, shifted some nucleotides there and there, and transferred some genes. No, I don't, nobody knows. It's a story, all of it. And, uh, but it was there, a mutant, mutation. And we are going to be hit again, I think. As a biologist, I believe very strongly in mutation. Mutants, they come. Some of them survive, and some of them fade away. This. Coronavirus has survived. But I don't know where it's gone now. Myself, I don't know. It, it has went to sleep. It's coming to wake up again, to be activated. Really, we don't know. But we, we'll show you here our history. So if you, if you read the history here, you can see, for example, the, the flu pandemic in 1889 to 1990 killed one million people. The Asian flu between 57 and 59 killed 1 million people. Okay, the Ecola epidemic killed 11,000 people. The Black Death of Ta'un, uh, which, you know, the plague in Europe between 1346 and 1353 killed 20 million people, of you, mostly in European. And uh, then if you take the Spanish flu between 1918 and 1920, killed 500, um, no, infected 500 million, but killed 50 million people. So if you take the swine flu, uh, virus al uh, 60 million infected, killed 500,000 people. So here we can see that Viruses, they come and go, and they kill. So science has to find out from where they come, why they come, and how to, co to confront them. Science has to do this because many people are killed and disappear. The economy, I mean, I don't want to just show, show, talk to you about the economy, but look at the economy for the last two or three years, how much we lost. How many trillions of dollars of 
uh, economy. Countries really lost in various, uh, field, in various sectors. So here, COVID-19 education response, what was it? Students' needs. And the well-being of students comes first. And this is where, where uh, Mr. Maslow come before Bloom. Professor Maslow come before Professor Bloom. Those are education, you know, very famous uh, educationist and uh, they became, a, a, you know, a model as example in the States, psychologist, both of them, psychologist in education. And, and Maslow, uh, this is that sometimes the need of the community, the need of the person comes first before educational objective. And this is where Maslow comes before Bloom. So first came the decision to close higher education institution as a result of corona, COVID-19. Then a measure, met, measure that we was part of the social distancing and confinement protocols adopted, adopted by many people, first by China and others, and recommended by WHO. UNESCO, uh, according to UNESCO by April 2020, last April 2020, 89.4% of enrolled students were affected by the closure of their schools, so, and closure of universities and institutions of higher education, uh, amounting to 1.5 billion, 1.5 million, 1.5 million billion learners worldwide has been, uh, they have been affected by corona, uh, COVID-19. So, so the, the response for COVID-19 education response was immediate really. The impact of the pandemic on education in the Arab region was more negative than in other parts of the world. Why? I'll show you why. And other world. And showed how bad the aesthetic sector is in need for reforms. This is what we should do, really. This is what we should do. We should do reform in education after the shortages we've seen as a result of COVID-19 in the Arab region. Technical infrastructure is not complete. They show you that internet, internet in every house. But many geographic location, they have no internet. And those people, they were cut from education for two to three years. They haven't seen education. This is disaster. And this is why the infrastructure of internet should be there in the Arab region, reaching everywhere. So no marginalization. Once you have marginalization, then you have a conflict between those who have knowledge, those who have access to information, and those who doesn't have access to information. So to avoid the conflict, we should spread the infrastructure equally, whether in rural area as in the urban area. Okay, then Reluctance and unreadiness of faculty to teach online. You'll be surprised. Not every faculty member know how to teach online, by the way, we found out as a result of this pandemic. People, some of them, they even they didn't use how the, the computer in a way, in a in, 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 in positive way. Uh, and this is where we need really to look at and to train and retrain uh, our staff, our faculty member and staff. So institutions who were unable to deliver distance learning either shifted their academic year, postponed graduation. They used to shift the year. Okay, no, first year, no teaching, I'll, I'll do it next year. Next year, no teaching, I'll do it third year. Oh, they come in the evening, they come in the morning. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really something uh, not realistic.
So, the education response, uh, initiative to retain and attract international students. Many universities, they lost their students. I know in Jordan, for example, we have about, uh, oh, we use between 20 and 29%, about almost 30% of our students are international students. They didn't come back as a result of the pandemic. They stayed home, particularly from the Gulf area. So many universities, they lost, and their budget is hectic. I mean, they don't have enough budget because, you know, international fee is different, and they support universities. So this is what happened. United Arab Republic, for example, the United Arab Emirates, sorry, uh, uh, they allowed new students to sponsor their relative, just to bring them in back to the Emirates. Egypt established new branches in the country in Africa. They went to university, they, they established branches in Africa because they have so many African students and so forth. Again, decrease in government funding. Government, by the way, there's a lot of revenues. So government did not support the university as used to. They cut off almost 25%. I know in Jordan, for example, about 30% was cut from all universities. And this is why they suffered as a result of COVID-19. Uh, so the institutional budget cuts, uh, uh, reduction in salaries, really. Uh, early uh, uh, retirements was making, uh, uh, freeze and uh, contracts, suspension, uh, elimination of tenure, uh, and also others, uh, which has affected the higher education institutions. Uh, and uh, so, uh, we have a gap uh, in the revenues uh, by most uh, higher institutions. So the immediate challenges, again, uh, from COVID-19, the internet, I mentioned this, 54% of individuals use the internet. Uh, and more than half of the household do not have the, the internet at house in the MENA region. So again, uh, almost 50% uh, of the people do not have access to internet in the MENA region. So this is another uh, uh, obstacle. Examination uh, and evaluation. Again, the assessment and the evaluation is lacking. I mean, really, face-to-face uh, -face learning, you know the assessment of it. You, you have evaluation every year. Uh, by, uh, by the end of each year, there's an evaluation of every course, every course almost. But in online learning, uh, the examination, uh, by the way, it's uh, way open, open book examination, uh, online learning. And, uh, and the grades, and I know in Jordan, for example, we never had so many people getting 90% and over in their overall grade system. But uh, in the online, for two to three years, those were uh, very high grades, very high grades. And th again, this is, uh, again, will affect really the, the delivery of higher education. Okay. Uh, conferences. I know, for example, the IAS, we didn't hold the conferences for two to three years, I think, two years, face to face. Again, we went in Zooming. But uh, was it effective, like we have right now, face-to-face -face conferencing? Again, so really there's a lot of uh, things which should, be, should be studied. How to improve the online and how to do it perfectly in the future in case we have another virus com comes to really uh, stop our face-to-face -face, uh, conferences, meeting, and education. Also research, again, will be affected because you have a joint research program. Can you do it online with other institutions in Europe, bridging with them? I don't know. Uh, so, so to exit uh, the crisis stage, to rethink 
the pre-COVID-19 status and to assist the implemented solution and invest in remote uh, learning. Uh, this is really the challenges, and this is what we should uh, plan uh, for the future. Again, uh, this will show you uh, the education fees and the activity which was affected. The medical school were affected. All medical schools were affected. And uh, the research in the university was affected. Okay. Uh, the pharmacy business education was affected. Uh, arts and design, engineering. Uh, we did some study and really we have no exception that all of them were affected. Okay. So beyond the pandemic, the challenges of recovery. Well, we have to look at the student pool. Uh, it is important to look back at the student uh, perspective and uh, provide answer to how, when, and why they want to learn first. Let's start from the student and backward. Reverse engineering, like we say. We start from the student and go back. Then the academic program it has to be shifted. It has to be, again, looked at and reworked to, to really serve uh, what I call the, 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 the new learning objectives. New learning objectives nowadays is different from the past. I mean, we need people to solve problems. We need people to tackle what we are facing, whether natural disaster or whether man-made disasters. And we need people to ensure food security, water security, and economic security, digital security, digital economy, in the future. This is where we are heading. Is our education system uh, can serve those goals? Can they serve those objectives? Then otherwise uh, we will be teaching students in a whole uh, without uh, really looking at uh, the future challenge and the future difficulty they are facing. Future trends and possibility. You see, in 1665, in Cambridge, Cambridge University closed like we closed because of the pandemic. They closed because of the plague, not virus. Plague. Okay. Ishaq Newton decided to work from home. And from home, he discovered calculus. And from home, Isaac Newton discovered the laws of motion, al-Jadibiyya. Just saying that sometimes it works from home because it's quiet, you think, you meditate. And meditation, by the way, leads to discovery. You see, without noise, without people bothering you and without having your wife every time bothering you here and there, you see, then you can really meditate <laughs> and invent the alias. Okay, future trends and possibilities. Here is uh, uh, the new perspective for the 21st century. Those are on the left, uh, really, uh, companies which uh, advocate or they, they are expert in making learning packages and uh, the webs which we are using nowadays online. The future trends uh, and possibility. Uh, well, I'm giving example here. One is uh, I think in Morocco uploaded digital educational courses from uh, various uh, universities of Morocco to serve university students. The acronym is MUN. Uh, I don't know, I didn't evaluate that, but what I've heard is uh, an innovation by itself. 
for new learning techniques and new pedagogy. The one in Jordan, we have a drug, uh, not in Dr. Jordan, sorry, in the Emirates, uh, the higher uh, learning or the higher technical institutions. Again, they have used digital transformation of education and they have been successful in uh, really developing their delivery and their educational system. So this is the conclusion. I think our education system, all of it, from KG to higher education, have to be resilient, flexible to meet challenges, which they come out suddenly. The educational <coughs> sustainability of how fast and strong you can react to environmental changes, to societal changes, to uh, endemic, pandemic, whatever you, you want to call it. I think this is really what we should aim to, that our education system should be flexible in curriculum, and facilities and objectives and really in meeting uh, to produce the thinkers of solving uh, problems. Co COVID-19, it's happened and it's been a case and I think we should learn from it. We shouldn't pass by, let it pass by. However, will we ever learn from our mistakes? I know sometimes, for example, the hurricane which was hit Florida and the United States last week and the week before, disaster. And they've been warning and warning and warning. I've been following it, by the way. I mean, a huge area devastated. And uh, people do not, uh, they are not taking seriously the warnings. And this is why so many people called and so many houses were lost, millions. I think we have to learn from history, we have to learn from incident, and we have to learn from COVID-19 pandemic for our future. Thank you indeed. زميل عدنان حصتان أقول له إذا ليس هو فقط بدغ واحد لكن هو بدغاني إذا سأفتح شهية القاعة لكي تشارك في وضع الأسئلة من يريد الكلمة تفضل I think if I'm not mistaken, the hurricanes that hit the United States, they actually come like footage from Africa. Is that right? And they travel all the way from Africa like little babies and eventually make them like a real dababa neck. Is that true, Radnan? This is good. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Well, I, I haven't studied or I haven't looked at uh, the origin of that. But I know, you know, you, you see when things hit, you don't hear about it until it hits the United States because of their strong media. The CNN, the BBS, uh, you know, everything. Everything goes out. You see, it hit first Cuba. And it hit Haiti. And it hit many islands there. But nobody mentioned until get close to Florida, then really the media wow. took over. So you could hear about it, uh, you can see what's uh, happening there and so forth. Uh, because the US has very strong media, very strong. As a matter of fact, the media in the US dominating the, 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 the media in the world. Uh, 
just let me say that. But really, uh, the origin from Africa, I don't know. Yes, and they, they, the, the information is so strong when it hits Florida because they wanted you to visit Florida <laughs> and see Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Dr. Badran, thank you very much for your, uh, for, for your talk, very illuminating uh, analysis of your talk. If uh, I want to make one uh, assumption uh, comment is that your last comment about uh, uh, wives disturbing the husbands is, is, was not uh, geared towards the new generation of scientists and scholars where it could be both husband and wife or husband can also uh, affect the, the, the wife. And the wives are not only uh, homemakers, but also our research scientists and among us are sitting here today even. So I would just like for us to be cognizant of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, during this pandemic period, we have all experienced the um, online training. And uh, we have noticed that after two years, we all have experienced this, uh, faculty members, students at the university, kids in primary school, in secondary school, and there are some limits to all these technologies because um, for different reasons, we know. The first reason is that school or university is not only the place where we go to get knowledge, it's a place where we learn about life. We start to have friends, start to have girlfriends or boyfriends. Sometimes we marry. Uh, we start to have enemies, to have uh, friends. And, and this, you cannot transmit this by on online learning. There is no way. Second, there are some branches of science, like medicine, <clears throat> or like engineering, training, where you need to make some experiments by your hands in the laboratory and no way, although you have virtual training, but it's not enough. What do you think? What is the right mix between online learning using these technologies and a training in presential within schools and the universities? Uh, whatever mix we have, face-to-face -face learning should not be cancelled or should not be wiped out. This is very important. I think you mentioned. You mentioned uh, the social life on the campus, the interactive process between students and professors, between students and students meeting together, uh, the extracurricular activity, which really melt the student personality and really become uh, a university graduate is not only armed with knowledge, but behavior, the way to talk with others, the way to convince, the way to handle matters. Uh, virtual learning is there but cannot replace face-to-face -face learning, can complement the process of learning. And this is good, because you, know, you never know. Some people simply, like uh, adult education, people who are working all day, uh, it's nice you know, to have some of the courses they take online. 
this is, will help out those people to become educated, particularly for a master's degree, you know, graduate work. Uh, but, and this is why I mentioned today blended learning. The blended learning is the answer. It's a mix of learning. The professor himself designed. We don't want to talk to the professor and to really nimbly ali, yani to lecture him how to, 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 to teach uh, his course. I think he is the authority of that course. But himself should look at it and see how do I serve the student better by blended learning, you know, having some lectures, uh, having something from the internet, having some simulation, some examples, you know, then uh, really become a facilitator rather than disseminator in the classroom. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> Maybe. It's okay. It's okay. She's, she's not looking at the front. I think. Yeah, please go. Take much time, but I want to make a small comment. Uh, I have like 42 years experience in teaching at universities. The worst students I ever taught are those who came after the pandemic. This online experience really, at least in my field in biology, the students, I could say they are the worst I taught in my life. I wonder, maybe some disagree with me or agree, but that's personal experience from what I see. And this is not my only my opinion the opinion of many of my colleagues in the department share me this. And uh, one other comment with which Dr. Badran concluded his uh, presentation to learn from history. We in the Arab world, we keep saying, and I think, yes, Well, uh, well, I have nothing to say, but I agree with uh, uh, Professor Baidun, what uh, he mentioned. I mean, Professor Baidun, uh, you know, has been teaching, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say how long, because he, he gets mad at me if I, if I say there's some secrets. But he's been, he's been teaching more than 35 years, <laughs> or 40 years. By the way, Professor Badu, I'm, 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 I'm really proud to say that I was his, uh, his professor and freshman, sophomore, senior at the University of Jordan. Then he went to the UB to get his master's degree and he went after that to Cambridge with Northcott to do his PhD. Anyway, uh, but I look when I stand by him, we look at the same age. And this is why he doesn't like to stand with me because uh, you know he wanted to feel that I am still his professor. It means I am 20 years older than him. Well, I am not. <laughs> Thank you. I have no, uh, uh, nothing to answer on this. Okay. Thank you very much. First of all, very inspiring because we were working for this uh, many years. Excellent presentation like always. My few uh, comments or suggestions uh, first, you said teachers are facilitators and you specifically on online, there is a problem. How many of the faculty, because I can, I have experience in my country, let's say Bimina region, the teachers are really facilitated even if there is no corona and no pandemic. Whether they are that kind of, how many percent, let's make it simple, that they are real facilitated in the classroom one. To little bit about gender equity, you talk about husband, wife, families. What about female faculty that those who are having kids were teaching and then they were at home? So the gender equity, an issue because of corona. And lastly, the reason that you said we are still thinking about uh, its origin, whether it is in the lab, from the animal, or whatever. But one of the major reasons since all these pandemics that you showed is the biodiversity loss. 
that we offer as a good host to the pathogen, come and stay with us because we are very rich from inside. We kill the birds, we kill the uh, animals. And uh, then from us, the home animal gets the disease also. Like in this corona, there are reports that uh, cats and dogs got uh, corona and then uh, they, they were spreading it. Lastly, safety and security of the labs. Uh, by specifically biology, when there are pathogens, microbiology labs, etc., and there was a pandemic and a lockdown, uh, and there were dangerous kind of in some of the laboratories. Any views about safety and biosecurity of the labs? Thank you. Well, uh, you ask very difficult question to know the percentage of the people who can really. Uh, you know, excel in uh, blended learning uh, utilization of, the, of uh, what I call uh, learning technologies and learning packages, and then uh, have access to other resource, other resources, uh, whether from the university itself or from outside the university and from ab abroad, you see, you know, with the globalization, I think uh, we, have, we have to think uh, not only locally, but uh, regionally and globally, because, uh, you know, we are graduating students to the world, not only to each country. I mean, uh, you know, when you look around, you will find people from various nationalities. They are working across borders, across borders. We are becoming interdependent, the interdependent uh, countries where we think uh, of the same uh, a global issue, uh, not only uh, at the local stage. So uh, how many percentage, this is again, it's very difficult to say. In each country is different. But if you ask me about Jordan, I want to tell you that 70% people who can really use uh, modern uh, teaching and learning processes because of the uh, training they receive from those uh, centers, faculty training centers, uh, about 30% to tell you the truth. Uh, I think they need to be retrained, to be retrained. But other countries, I don't know. I don't know uh, how, how large uh, the, the segment of those people who can uptake and intake uh, really the, the new process, the, the, the modern technology of learning. Uh, but about gender and equal, equality, again, uh, this is a question raised by, uh, by the NGOs all the time. You see, some countries really, they have equal opportunities and uh, equal opportunities for all. Uh, they don't discriminate whether uh, on sect or religion or uh, gender uh, or uh, tribe, tribal discrimination. And some countries still living in the past where they discriminate, they feel that men, you know, Mujtama Dhukuri and Mujtama Dhukuri are Mujudi and then Nasaf. Let's uh, say equality, full equality between women and men, and men and women, uh, is not there in many countries. But some countries, they, they have advanced. They have advanced. And some countries, they're still uh, playing around it, you see. They are, uh, just simply, they, 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 they haven't achieved what uh, should be achieved uh, in the equality. I don't know if I answer some of your questions. <coughs> البدع باللغة العربية هو القمر في إضاءته الكاملة لما أقول بدران هو قمران فإذا سحق حصة كاملة عن جدارة وأخيرا مع نهاية جلستنا أقول العلوم والتكنولوجيا تتقدم بسرعة منذ الخمسينات القرن الماضي وتتقدم بسرعة هائلة في العشاريات الأخيرة فماذا عن الابتكار؟ المداخلتان باختصار في المنظورين التي تم عرضهما عليكم أيها السادة والسيدات 
ركزت على جدول الابتكار وأهميته في الإنجازات التي تعود بالخير في التنمية التي تسعى المجتمعات الواعية لتحقيقها العرض الأخير في نظري لا يحتاج إلى ترخيص أو تذكير لكن لا بد أن نشير إلى قيمة العرض الأول الذي سجلته بكامل العناية خاصة ما يجب أخذه بعين الاعتبار والذي يمكنه تحقيق التنمية المستديمة لقطاع الماء وعلى رأسها الأمن المائي تجاوز شح الماء أيام الجفاف السدود ومردوديتها عند الفيضانات وما تتركه من كوارث التحديات المستقبلية لتجاوز كل العقبات في إطار تنافسية إيجابية أساسها الابتكار ولا شيء غير الابتكار سجلت هذه الومضات لأذكر بقيمة هذا العرض الذي قدمه خبيرنا في ميدان الفياحة والزراعة ببلدنا الحبيب شكرا لأكاديمية العالم الإسلامي وطاقمها الذي ساهم في تحقيق ما كنا نرجو إليه في هذه هذا المؤتمر وشكرا لأكاديمية الحسن الثاني للعلوم والتقنيات بطاقمها الكامل من مختصين ومن مشاركات أعضائها البابيزين وأخيرا شكرا للطاقم المقتدر الذي سهر على الترجمة الفورية بكل أمانة أشكر الجميع على حسن صبركم ونرفع الجلسة